All right, so this is part two. Uh, hopefully this doesn't go too long, but um, yeah, so I'll do, uh, hmm, I think I will go to solo piano now. And I have to begin with, and it's hard to say things like this because they almost mean nothing when you get to classical music with so many geniuses, but there is almost nothing more completely transcendental and timeless than Chopin, his nocturnes. And you can go to his ballads, his mazurkas, his waltzes, his sonatas. I mean, it's just... I don't, I, I don't think I could say that anyone else's body of work is as perfect as his. The only things I don't like of his are his cello sonata. I, he has multiple, I think, and his piano concertos. I don't really like them very much. But he was a genius at the solo piano. I mean, as far as the percentage goes of his works that are just completely unique and amazing for the time that he wrote them, let alone for today, that they, that they even were ever written by a single human. And he died so young, too. Like, uh, his, his nocturnes are just one of the most perfect selections of music you can choose, especially his late nocturnes. I mean, his Opus 9, number 2, I mean, come on, it's with millions of views, one of the best pieces of music and then you get to like his 20th Nocturne, which is just, there's nothing better. There's nothing better like his 14th Nocturne. I mean, yeah, I don't want to go on just saying names, but man, they're just awesome. And then also to go perfectly along with it, Scriabin. Scriabin knew Chopin was a genius and Scriabin himself was a genius. His sonatas, his 10 sonatas are all amazing the first four i like i particularly enjoy um but i can appreciate the fifth through tenth um his preludes of course chopin's preludes i knew i was missing a p but yeah his preludes um his etudes i mean come on how can uh just how can you compete how can you compete even comparing literature to chopin it's like come on man such a genius and then you go to Scriabin his, his all of his preludes his etudes his sonatas his mazurkas his waltzes his his more interesting works like uh the uh, Ver, vers la flamme um his etude opus 8 number 12 i mean it really doesn't get better it does not get better I've always had the image in my head of his Opus 8 number 12 being the perfect music to a black and white silent film of the end of humanity. I always imagine it like standing on a beach with groping together on this beach of the Tumid River, but instead of a river being like the beach of the Atlantic Ocean, and there's just a a pyroclastic flow of the atmosphere burning up in front of you, coming at you at the speed of sound, just ready to annihilate you and everyone you know standing on this beach together. All the while it's silent in black and white and you have his Opus 8 number 12 playing. Um, which I admit is a little extravagant, but that's always how I imagined it. I think his preludes are amazing too. I I really love his selection of preludes. And um yeah, to continue on with preludes, uh, Rachmaninoff. This um I really see them as like a trinity, like a, the, the holy trinity, I guess you could say of solo piano music. Chopin as the uh the like the main guy and then you have Scriabin and Rachmaninoff. Scriabin and Rachmaninoff are 3 years apart. 1872 and 1875. I mean, how does that happen? How does that happen? Just like 
Robert Browning, 1812, uh, Herman Melville, 1819. I mean, how does that stuff happen? How? Oh, man, it's just crazy. Walt Whitman was born in the same year as Herman Melville. How does this stuff happen? Just unbelievable. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, Rachmaninoff, his preludes... His second piano sonata has one of the best introductions ever. It's just a cascade of... Man, it's just awesome. Um, what else? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't get better than Rachmaninoff's Preludes. His 24 Preludes, it just doesn't get better than that. Um, then you have Metner, who's in the same kind of family is Scriab and Rachmaninoff. I think he's a bit younger than them. Uh, my favorite piano work of his is his Nightwind Sonata. Um, I don't think it, I don't think he's quite as good as the other guys, but uh, it's completely unique work. Very good. Um, next I have Ravel. I mean, Ravel's piano works are completely amazing. He is another just masterpiece after masterpiece that he wrote. And I made a full-length video. Uh, it's called a sachet, sachet number one on Ravel, where I just went over his whole life and works. Um, it's more of like a general video, but still, I'm sure you'd enjoy it. Um, Bark sur Lochin, his miroir, miroirs are amazing. Um, his Gaspar de la Nuit, just completely unique and amazing works that you can listen to a hundred times and hear new things every time you listen to them. It's kind of like a corollary. I've I wanted to read Aloysius Bertrand, his Gaspar de la Nuit for a while, but I can never find it. It's not even at my library and it's expensive. It's like 20 bucks. So um, yeah, if anyone has an extra copy laying around if, and I can solicit it from you. Uh, next, I have Debussy, going along with Ravel. Um, everyone knows Debussy, his Claire de Lune, the Sweet Bergamasque, which is excellent um, taken as a whole. You know, if you you don't always need to listen to Claire de Lune, the whole thing is very good by itself. Uh, then you have, like, La Fille aux Chevaux de Lain, which is also very good um, as a violin piece. Uh, Yasha Heifetz. Um, his arabesques, I mean, amazing. Um, let's see, who else do I have here? Oh yeah, Dvorak, uh, his humoresques. His, uh, his seventh humoresque, I think it's like Opus 111 or 103 something. But that's actually that's probably my favorite piece of music play uh, for violin. Uh, Misha Elman has an amazing recording of Dvorak's Humoresque, and that's actually my favorite piece to play on the violin too. I don't play the violin very well. I'm I'm really not very skilled at it, but I love playing Dvorak's Humoresque. There's almost nothing. It really just totally annihilates time and. Like, that's that's as close as life gets to heaven, I think. Um, For Alina by uh, Arvo Part. It's really... It's really dark music. Um, complete contrast to For Elise. Um, but it's, it's complete, like, soul-crushing music, this For Alina. Um... Arvo Part, I think, is the best uh, composer that's alive. Best contemporary composer. I don't even think it's very close. I mean, Philip Glass is good, but... Just the depths that Arvo Part gets to, and his... Uh, the ability that he has to be appreciated by anyone, uh, I think it doesn't get better than that. Um, then you have Sati. I mean, everyone knows Sati. The Gymnopede and Nossiens... Um, which are amazing, unique works. Uh, 
He has some other interesting works, but I think those are definitely his high point. Um, Bartok. This may be an unusual choice. Bartok's Rhapsody for solo piano, Opus 1. Um, you'll know Bartok had three Opus sets uh, where he he had a first one that he did when he was really young. He, he destroyed it. I mean, kind of not destroyed it, but reset it. And then he did another set when he was uh, like, I think late teens, early 20s, maybe mid 20s, and then like reset himself basically. And that this Rhapsody Opus 1, I think, is his first of the second set of Opus numbers. I may be wrong on that. I haven't looked at it in probably a year, but um, this is based on the... I think it's it's that gypsy um, mode. What is it? Phrygian? I think Phrygian. Anyway, I don't know it very well, but um, it's an extremely good piece of music. A lot of good melodies. It's more like a late romantic than what Bartok got into later in his career, but um, it's extremely good. Then, of course, Liszt. I mean, no solo piano would be complete without Liszt. His Liebestrom, his uh, Noage Gris, his Piano Sonata, uh, even this isn't solo piano, but his Totentons. Boom, 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 boom. Dr. Faustus feeling Mephistopheles. Um, what was I thinking of just then? Shoot, I lost it. Um, but yeah, list his Liebestrom is the third Liebestrom is just extremely good too. And then Respighi, we come back to Respighi, who I don't see on many lists, and it's very bizarre to me because his Nocturno, his Nocturne, I think it's his opus number four or something that he wrote when he was very young. It's such a beautiful work for solo piano. I mean, it's just so good and. Man, Respighi is one of the top composers of the time. Um, did I miss any other solo piano pieces? I mean, uh, Camille Saint-Saëns, his, his later works, I think. Oh, I don't know what it is, but it's like, it's in his hundreds. Opus 100 and something. It's uh, a set of etudes. It's uh, number six. It's very good. Um, Brahms. Brahms solo piano stuff is extremely good. Um, oh, Beethoven. I mean, of course, his piano sonatas. Um, oddly enough, I don't really like Tchaikovsky's piano so, uh, solo piano works. I don't really know why. He wrote a really long uh, sonata. I just, I just don't like it that much. Um, Alken. Alkin's uh, Carnival, of, uh, not Carnival of the Animals, is it? No, it's, um, oh, come on, what is it? It's the Greek guy. <sighs> Shoot. It's the Greek guy with an A. Man, I don't know. Shoot. Well, uh, okay, I'll go on to... Um, general chamber works. So first I have Shostakovich Piano Quintet, which I've been listening to. I just, I must have listened to it a while ago, but I just rediscovered it basically the last couple days, and I've just been loving it. I think Opus 57 or something it is, 47 maybe. Um, it's just completely amazing. I really love Shostakovich had an amazing ear for harmonies, and I think that comes from his uh, study of Bach, his fugues and things. He has such a good ear for harmony. Um, Dvorak's Piano Quintet also, Opus 81, I think it's number two, Piano Quintet number two. It's one of the most calm music, pieces of music ever, The how it begins. I can just hear it. I've listened to it so much, I can just hear it in my head. It's so gorgeous. Um, also, this comes from Dvorak's uh, American period, his string quintet, 
string quintet. It has a lot of the same feelings as the string quartet um, number 12, but um, it has more like throaty feelings, deep, because uh, the the quintet. Um, next, I wrote uh, Debussy's cello and violin sonatas. He wrote those later in his career, and they're both very good. They're both very minimalistic, I would say. Even apart from the fact that it only has a piano and a violin, like you get to something like Rachmaninoff's um, cello concerto or cello sonata, it's not minimalistic. No one would ever say it is, but Debussy's cello sonata is also being fairly short. Um, it's really, it's really a masterpiece. Both of them are. I think I prefer the violin sonata a little more, but it doesn't. It hardly matters when you get to the top level. It's, it's like the opposite of shuffling deck chairs on the Titanic. It's, it's meaningless, but it's not a doomed enterprise. It's, it's like maybe shuffling deck chairs in heaven or something. I don't know. Um, Beethoven's violin sonatas. I mean, the Kreutzer sonata is one of the best of all of the works. Um, see uh yeah you have uh Janoshek, his violin sonata um and you have uh Enescu, the romanian is number three uh which is really influenced by like gypsy music it's very good um then maybe a unusual one that most people don't know uh, Martinu, Bohuslav Martinu, his three madrigals for violin and viola. That's actually one of my favorite pieces of music. And uh, it's kind of like a neo-baroque from, I think he was writing it in like the 1940s or 1930s. It was kind of late. Um, but yeah, it's like a neo-baroque, as you imagine from the title, three madrigals. And they're amazing. Um, then I have Spiegel, I'm Spiegel by Arvo Part, which is just, oh, it, it transcends words. It's such a beautiful piece of music. I can listen to it for 10 hours in a row and not be bored. I'm sure I've listened to it over a hundred times, probably a day's worth of playtime. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, then another unusual one that may not be very well known is, uh, Zdenek Fibich his piano quintet, which I found through this very good uh, channel, Unsung Masterworks. I would recommend just going there and listening to every single thing they post um, because it's one of the best channels on YouTube to find new, great classical music. Um, I think they also post all of Scriabin's symphonies. Uh, that's one I missed when I talked about symphonies, his Divine Symphony, number three, which... Um, Boris Pasternak listened to the piano reduction of when he was writing the symphony and that made him want to be a composer, Pasternak to be a composer. Um, I mean, I missed a whole bunch of Sarasate, so Sarasate solo violin music, his uh, Spanish stuff. I missed uh, Vinovsky, his virtuoso violin music. Um, I mean, I miss so much, but I don't want to make this... What is this already? An hour that I've been recording this? I can't imagine many people will watch this, but if someone else made this, I would watch the whole thing. So that's the only reason I'm making this. All right, now I'll just go to general orchestral works, and then I think I'll close after that. Um, first, I have Delius Florida Suite, which is another one of my top maybe five pieces of music Um, this is one of Delius's early works, like may have been like his first or second opus that he published. And, uh, it came from, he used a German by birth. No, no, he was, he's British. And he went to Germany to study music, but then somehow he ended up 
in uh, Georgia, I think, Georgia and Florida. And then when he came back, he wrote this Florida Suite, which is an extremely good piece of music. Um, yeah, that's another one I can just hear, the, all of it. Um, I have a really good memory of going to Santa Fe and um, we watched the Shakespeare production of Romeo and Juliet. It was in a charter school. Like kind of like a suburb suburb area, kind of run down. And we went to this charter school and saw this production of Shakespeare. They memorized the whole play. Like it was a, it was an excellent production of it. I mean, you know, they kind of cheap props, uh old guys playing young young people, men playing women, women playing men. It's kind of like, you know, full it was a full imaginative event, but it started to rain halfway through and it was in a courtyard. So they were actually getting rained on the actors. So all of us watching, it was maybe 10 or 15 people went under the awnings and they continued acting in the rain. And that was just such a sublime experience. And the reason I bring this up is because after we left, I loved it so much. Um, I had this playlist on my, my phone. I had a Delius Florida Suite. And it really got storming once we, once we left. Um, and I can see like the lightning streaks through the sky and hearing this Florida Suite playing in my car. It's just such a good memory. Um, next I have Webern, Im Sommerwind, which... Uh, when Webern wrote it, it was never performed until like 1970s or something, which I think is just so unfortunate because it's a completely amazing work. It's it's not in his um, tone tone row inspired by Schoenberg later style. It's not in that style. It's in a late romantic, completely beautiful. Uh, not to imply the tone row isn't beautiful, but. Um, it's just completely gorgeous. It was written based on a poem um, because Webern missed his his home um, country house that I think his dad sold, uh, the Preghoff, um, which is very inspirational for me. That that idea of like um, an Austrian. Uh, I think Webern was what, 1883, born in 83. So that would make him like late 1890s when he was a teen in the Preghoff. I mean, I just, it's such clear for me imagining that, what it would have been like, like on a hill in Austria, maybe east of the Tyrol Mountains. Like, oh man. Um, next, I have Sibelius, his Vaus Triest. I've always liked waltzes. They've been one of my favorite uh, dance rhythms. And whenever a symphony employs like a waltz rhythm, I love it. And uh, Sibelius's Valse Triste is very good. Um, and then here's kind of an unusual one. Um, Weinberg. Miseslaw Weinberg, his cello and orchestra, opus number 43. Um... It's an unusual work, but it's one of those ones. He wrote a lot of stuff, but uh, he also had family die in the Holocaust. But uh, it's an amazing work. Uh, not very well known, unfortunately, but it deserves to be well known. Um, next, I have Schnitke, Alfred Schnitke, who it's probably like along with Arvo Part the best like contemporary more or less contemporary composer in in my opinion um his concerto grosso his like neo baroque polystylic polyphonic uh, pastiche oriented i think it's it really gets to the modern experience the contemporary experience the 
the precision that he pastiches things. His also his uh, his suite in the old style. I think that's what it's called. Is just so perfect a replication of like classical Baroque music. It's um, is Tango in a Madhouse also. Oh man, that's the the Rondo for the Concerto Grosso. It's just amazing. It's it's like full on Madhouse music. Like you're you're halfway through a dissociative episode and you're you're like living in a Hieronymus Bosch painting. It's like, it's, it's, it's intense, but it's good. It's so good. Um, Strauss, Tod und Verklarung, Death and Transfiguration. These young, these guys wrote works when they were young and they're just so good. Delius, Florida Sweet, Webern's in Sommerwind, um, Strauss, Tod und Verklarung. And there's an interesting story about Strauss that when he was dying, I think he was in his 80s, his Metamorphosen is also just completely beautiful work. Probably the best work of uh, piece of music that comments on World War II, just the immense tragedy and like absurd loss of it. Um, but yeah, as Toden Voklarung, the story is uh, that when he was dying, like when he was on his deathbed and he was dying, he said something to the effect of, I got it, I got it right in uh, Tod und Verklarung. He said it like, you know, I, I got it right, I got it perfect. Because he was in his 20s, like early 20s when he wrote Death and Transfiguration, so... Um, Oh, and then, of course, I mean, come on. Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. There is nothing that captures America in the 1920s better than that. Nothing. No poems, no novels. Well, I'm getting a little extravagant here. Hard Crane's poetry and John Dos Passos' novels. They, they are... Yeah, I can't say that. I can't say that nothing captures it. But as far as music goes, uh, Rhapsody in Blue is... I can listen to it forever. Um, and then here's another um, interesting, rare one that's also very good. Um, Variations on a Theme of Frank Bridge by Benjamin Britten. And this is an unusual one, but uh, he does kind of like a, like a polystylic thing like Schnitke does, where he takes, a, a, obviously, a theme of Frank Bridge and does variations, but... They're very diverse variations, and it's a very good theme that he chose. Oh yeah, another with Rachmaninoff, his variations on a theme of Paganini and variations on a theme of Chopin. I mean, they're just amazing. Where he reverses the theme in the variation on the theme of Paganini, I mean, oh. it's that's the thing that gets me about classical music. It's just ineffable. It's, you can't say anything about it. And that's why, you know, how ridiculous is that? I'm, I'm an hour and 20 minutes in to talking about classical music. And at the end, I say, I can't say anything about it. You know, oh, well, real clever. But yeah, I've been reading, um, kind of like dipping into it. Um, Thomas Mann, his Dr. Faustus. And it's just so enjoyable to read about classical music because unfortunately it's not very well represented in uh, literature. Classical music isn't. Um, I've also been reading uh, Robert Browning, his um, early poetry, Sordello. I've um, been reading The Death of Virgil. Last night I had like a really just lovely time just like dipping into different works. I read a little bit of Darkenville's Cat. Um, I read some John Donne poetry. I read um, a little bit of the Anatomy of Melancholy. I just had a, I had a good night. Long story short, I had a good night. But um, yeah, well, this is really rambly and very long. I I hope you enjoy it. If if you 
feel free to leave a comment. Do you have any recommendations for me of um, maybe like really obscure works that are very good? Or if you want recommendations, I can give you some recommendations on pieces if you give me a list of works that you really like. Um, or if you like this, I, I would love to have uh, other people make videos about classical music that they like. Um, I know it's not a common interest, and I, I hold that with a heavy heart that that's the case, because I haven't found anything more completely beautiful and perfect and more of more of a justification for humanity's existence than classical music. And I really wish more people could see that, even if my opinion of it is fairly um, fairly extreme or um, extravagant even. I, I wish people could even glimpse how much I love the music. And I know most people don't. And uh, yeah, I really, it's really a shame. It's, it's, it's a shame. It's, I can't. Yeah, but anyway, hope you enjoyed it. This was a long recording. I can't believe I just did this, an hour and 20 minutes. But, yeah, I've been wanting to do it for a long time, and I've just been immersed in classical music for eight years, at least, nonstop. So, just had to talk about it. So... Death is a gang, boss.